And as far as the risks are concerned, medical experts are saying that the side effects are minimal. The only side effect, um, well, there's two potential. One, um, which most people are thrilled about, some people do get a little happier and cheerful. So that psychoactivity, it, it is a side effect and needs to be listed that your mood might improve, okay? Um, it cuts your appetite, and particularly appetite for sweets. So the more people like going on these CBD diets, which I, I kind of hate to talk about because I don't want it to go to that level, but it, it works. Just like THC gives you the munchies, CBD gives you the anti munchies. We have strains now that we're growing that are just being harvested this week that have like a 25 to 1 ratio of CBD to THC. Our current plants have 2 to 1. This was like a genetic miracle that happened. So we'll be able to make tinctures that have as little THC as hemp does. So they'll be kind of the same as hemp tinctures and potentially legal. To debunk the age-old question, does smoking weed kill brain cells? Well, as far as the CBD is concerned, the results are quite the opposite. It saves brain cells, and if your brain cells are injured, it helps heal them quicker, and heart cells as well. But dosable cannabis medicine is the future. There is only one city where wealth and luxury are part of everyday life and your wildest fantasies can become realities. Rising from the desert sand, Dubai has become the fastest growing metropolis the world has ever seen. And we have your exclusive ticket inside this incredible icon. Join us on a journey to uncover the secret world of the rich and famous as we attend the invite-only World Luxury Expo and explore this fascinating emirate. You won't want to miss it. Welcome to round two of the ultimate playground for men in Dubai. If you want to see crazy new cars or try your luck at a newly invented water sport, then do I have the convention for you. Get ready because Boys Toys is coming your way. Regardless of whether marijuana is legal or not, the fact is many people are using the substance every day under our current drug policy, which says it's against the law. Many estimates claim that 16.7 million people reportedly used the illegal substance within the last month, and not all of whom have medical conditions. Some people just like the mind-altering buzz and use it recreationally. Tens of millions of people in this country smoking weed. I mean, are we kidding ourselves? You know, certainly I know of a few, anecdotally of a few people who are, you know, stand-up lawyers, doctors, professors, whatever, that you wouldn't think of as your classic stoners who happen to be marijuana users. If so many people are using it already, why is the leafy green substance illegal? Well, certainly like most things that are labeled bad, there is a monumental moral debate going on across the country. We have perpetuated this failed system for so long, basically because of one reason, children. My kids are going to do it is obviously a reasonable concern. There are lots of things which may be reasonable for adults, but are not a good idea for kids. The first order fact is kids are doing it already, even with prohibition. We care very much about the children, which is why we would like to do the same thing that we did with tobacco and alcohol, which was put an age limit on the substance and, and studies show that young people's use of both tobacco and alcohol declines significantly. If you legalize and regulate something such as marijuana, that it's actually going to prevent access. You do not see children on their high school campuses selling Jim Beam bourbon to each other, but they're selling illegal drugs all the time, caused by drug prohibition. Ask the first teen, 10 teenagers you find what is easier for them to get if they want to. That's the key. Marijuana or alcohol. And the 
all tell you, to the degree they've thought about it, it's easier to get marijuana. Why? Because the illegal marijuana dealers do not ask for ID. Then the sellers would be people who would be above ground, who would have an incentive to not violate the rules against selling to minors, whereas right now the people who are selling to minors are already felons merely by selling the good at all, and so they don't really care that much whether they're selling to a 16-year-old or selling to a 25-year-old. Now, maybe more kids will do it if it's legalized, although our experience with alcohol, you know, it doesn't really suggest that. One person's focus on their use from a moral perspective shouldn't crowd out our focus on all these other effects of causing lots of violence in Latin America, which presumably also has a moral dimension if you want to think of it in those terms. When it comes to marijuana, uh, people are essentially legislating morality. Uh, they feel that marijuana use is immoral and therefore it's illegal and therefore if you use it, you're a criminal. These are decisions that people are making for their own bodies. And these are decisions that, that should be left to the individual to make. The whole thing of having 16, 17, and 18 year old kids getting stoned is not something we're looking for, but having a war against it has not worked. It is certainly true that many people who consume harder drugs have also consumed marijuana in the past, and many of them had consumed marijuana before they consumed the harder drugs, although there are obviously a lot, plenty of exceptions to that pattern as well. But the main fact is that zillions of people consume marijuana and don't go on to harder drugs. Millions of people consume alcohol and don't go on to marijuana. If you just look at the temporal sequencing, you would say that, that french fries are a gateway to alcohol or to heroin or whatever, because everyone who's consumed heroin has consumed McDonald's french fries back, you know, when they were kids or something like that. So it's, it's just a completely unpersuasive hypothesis for which there is not good evidence. Aside from the moral issues at hand, a percent of the population does in fact struggle with addiction problems. And when posing the question, should marijuana become legal, many worry that the illegal drug will lead to even more addiction problems. There are many of these people that use marijuana for, for medical purposes. Um, people that use medicine aren't necessarily drug addicts. There certainly are many people who try marijuana and decide that they enjoy it and continue to use it. But of course you could say the same thing about zillions of people's use of ice cream or addiction to exercise or downhill skiing or whatever. So addiction can be way too broad a concept. No matter what side of the issue you're on, do consider that it is certainly within the interest of groups and companies across the country to keep this drug illegal. I think some people think that it's wrong morally or ethically or religiously or something. Okay? I think there are significant interest groups that benefit from current policy from continuing prohibition. So some parts of law enforcement clearly would lose their jobs if marijuana and other things were made legal. So they have a, a personal stake in continuing current policy. The pharmaceutical industry, which doesn't want a plant to be available as an alternative medicine, the treatment sector gets a lot of its business from the fact that drugs are illegal because a lot of people refer to treatment because they're arrested. Whether you think that's true or not, it clearly is in the interest of the treatment sector, and so they also are a factor maintaining the status quo. Fourth group are the politicians, the ones who get elected and re-elected by talking tough with regard to the war on drugs. Uh, the liquor industry is opposed to it because they don't want people, they're worried about people using marijuana as an alternative to alcohol. Obviously are the Mexican drug cartels, the big time drug sellers, and they're winning, making tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, tax-free, they're coming out ahead. Predominant source of funding for all terrorist groups around the world is what? The sale of illegal drugs. The, the only reason cannabis is not legal is, I mean, the number of jobs, if you add them up in law enforcement and prisons, I mean, how are we putting people in prison when our own federal government, Department of Health and Human Services has the patent on this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's insanity. Miracles of Nature. The journey begins this Saturday on AWE. Join host Pam Glennon as she ventures deep into the Middle East to the fascinating emirate of Abu Dhabi on the next Extreme Vacations. Whichever way you view it, or use it for that matter, marijuana is still a Scheduled One illegal substance at a federal level. At the state level, however, 
some are allowing the use under certain restrictions. My advice as an attorney is don't get involved in this industry because you're going to be violating federal law. However, there are ways to comply with state law. The law states that patients um, can possess, transport, and cultivate for their own personal medical use. So right now, we're in this murky gray area that essentially states patients can possess an amount of marijuana reasonably related to their medical needs. Right now, as it stands, cultivation of marijuana is a felony. Even one plant that's six inches tall, you can be charged with a felony. The potential penalties for a felony uh, for cultivation or possession with intent to sell are 16 months, two years, or three years in state prison. If you are a patient here and I'm saying that you should take two sprays of this, you know, three times a day, giving you specific instructions or telling you a list of places where you can get it is, on a federal level, aiding and abetting. If you have a felony on your record, it's going to uh, seriously impact your future. You can recover from an addiction. What you cannot recover from is from a conviction. Nationally, we have 2.4 million people behind bars, 1.7 million in prison, and 700,000 in jail. Of those, about 500,000 are for drug law violations. And of those, 30,000 are for marijuana violations. So if we legalized marijuana only, the effect on prison overcrowding would be something, but it wouldn't be huge. There are not a ton of people in prison on marijuana charges. In California, it costs $46,000 a year to incarcerate uh, people. We only spend $8,000 per year on our students. That could free up 30,000 inmates from our already overcrowded prison systems and could potentially save the government $1.38 billion that would have gone to incarcerating a marijuana conviction. On the other end of the spectrum, and not to advocate the idea, but several different countries have decriminalized all drug use. A couple of countries recently that we've seen who are having positive results uh, with, with regards to uh, drug legalization and decriminalization would be Switzerland uh, and Portugal. In Portugal, 2001, they decriminalized all drugs. All drugs. What happened? Well, first of all, they found that drug usage remained the same. If anything, it went down like two-tenths of a percent. So by and large, it stayed the same. We can learn from the Portuguese experience. It's working. Under this proposed decriminalized system, or even under a legal system, there is still always the concern for problematic drug use. We cannot create laws that will keep people always from doing foolish things. With the United States racking up nearly $15 trillion in national debt, it's time to have an honest debate on what to do about our fiscal problems. The current state of the economy, the U.S. had one of the largest recessions in its history. We have started to recover from that, that is, the recession officially ended, but growth has been relatively weak compared to most recoveries from recessions. I think there's a reasonable possibility of getting back to the pre-existing trend, but that would require fairly radical changes in policy, which politically are unlikely to happen. One example of a radical change in policy could be the legalization of marijuana. Two aspects of government budgets that will be affected by legalization. One is that we wouldn't be spending the money on arrests, on prosecutions, on incarcerations. The second aspect is the U.S. would be able to collect tax revenue on legalized marijuana. And experts have estimated that $6.2 billion could be collected if we tax the substance at similar rates to tobacco and alcohol. For instance, the current price on a pack of cigarettes in New York City is nearly $11. More than half that elevated price is comprised of city, state, and federal taxes. Uh, I would regulate marijuana like wine. In effect, Marijuana is the largest cash crop in the state of California today, and in many ways it's the largest cash crop in the, in the, in the United States. In California, the number two crop, by the way, is grapes. So that tells me that somebody's using it. So instead of prohibiting it, which is brings in the worst of all worlds, let's treat it like wine. Let's have a statewide organization, the Alcohol Beverage Control Board that governs wine, put in their enforcement and everything else. 
We lose more cash, more money from the United States of America because of drug prohibition than anything else other than oil. It's like people in a never-ending line pushing wheelbarrows full of $50 bills back into Mexico or Colombia or whatever. So that money could be saved. I think if we legalize marijuana, that would mean having it be available to anyone who wants to purchase it for whatever use. So some would use it recreationally, some would use it medicinally. So I don't think we make ha have to make that distinction at all if we fully legalize. So there would be an age limit, vendors would be licensed, producers of the product would be licensed, and they would be, you know, inspected and held to standards. We should never assume that we can make things perfect. We're not going to have a complete absence of adverse things related to drugs, no matter what the policy is, just as we don't have an absence uh, for alcohol. We're, there are going to be some people who misuse, some people who drive under the influence, and so on. Similarly to alcohol, there could also be consequences for people who choose to get behind the wheel while impaired. Well, we, we have laws against driving under the influence of drugs already on the books in most places, so we can certainly have those. Now, the ability to test whether someone was driving under the influence or was under the influence is difficult, more difficult for some substances than others. For example, marijuana stays in one system for more than just a few hours, so someone could have been smoking two days ago, get in the car, no longer under the influence at all, but still test positive for marijuana. And I understand that now there's the test where you can actually swab the inside of your mouth and you can determine whether someone has actually smoked marijuana within the last five hours or so. So modern science will come to the rescue. Under our current system for alcohol and tobacco sales, we do not see a violent black market style distribution associated with these sometimes addictive substances. If marijuana were to also become legal, this violent trend may subside. So bringing the market above ground should eliminate a huge fraction of violence, which is mainly due to the illegal nature, not to the use of the substances per se. It eliminates the corruption because the reason for the corruption is the illegality. You don't see much corruption in legal markets. Nobody has any particular incentive. Talk about Mexico, for example. More than 50,000 people have died a violent death in Mexico because of this war on drugs. It has nothing to do with drugs whatsoever. It has everything to do with drug money. The corruption, the violence, the killing is all a response to drug money. And by the way, it's our drug money that has done it. Shame on us. Besides diminishing the harms associated with drug violence, another area of improvement is quality control. Most of the harms are caused by the unknown strength and the unknown quality of the drugs, and that's critically important. When we had alcohol prohibition, we had what I called the, the bathtub gin effect, where people, would, you'd get a bad batch of the alcohol and it would attack your nervous system. A lot of people were died, a lot of were put into comas. That went away completely when we repealed alcohol prohibition. I mean, there's no way there's not going to be battles. There's no way the pharmaceutical company is happy about this stuff because it's sold at like one-eighth to one-tenth the price. I sort of think that it might change a lot under a sort of Nixon goes to China scenario, that a conservative Republican will come out for legalization. I think in some ways it's harder for a moderate or liberal Democrat to come out for it because those politicians are going to fear that if they do that, they're going to lose everybody in the middle. A second term conservative might say, you know what, this is my sort of gift to the future. I'm, it's time to, to say that the, the emperor has no clothes on this issue. I think it's inevitable that it will be legalized. We will look back on it the way we look at uh, uh, women's suffrage, uh, segregation, uh, gay rights, and we're going to wonder how could we have perpetuated such a failed system for so long. Anyone who's watching this program should really just consider the cost to society of marijuana prohibition. Look at how much it's costing us in law enforcement, uh, in prisons. So I think really what, what people should take away from this is that by regulating a substance such as marijuana, we can have much more control over it. It's time for the U.S. and even the world to rethink the current drug policy. By prohibiting a plant, we are creating much more cost than benefit and our nation can't afford it. It's time to change.
Each year, globally, nearly 13 million people learn they have cancer. And almost 8 million die from this horrible disease. In addition to cancer, millions more suffer from chronic pain, Alzheimer's, post-traumatic stress, arthritis, and countless other diseases and ailments. These conditions are serious, but what can we do to solve these problems and illnesses plaguing our country? What if that one little thing was marijuana? In the next hour, we'll hear the stories of people who have healed their life-threatening diseases with cannabis and learn about a newly discovered system in our bodies that may just hold the secret to keeping us healthy and disease-free. Most people think of marijuana as just a stoner's drug. Well, forget all of that because CBD and THC, actual chemicals found in this plant, could just be the key to saving your life. On a federal level, marijuana is listed along with LSD and heroin as a Schedule I drug, meaning it is considered the worst of the drugs and the United States federal government defines it as having no accepted medical uses. This is where the drug debate becomes debatable to say the least. Meet Irvin Rosenfeld. At age 10, he was diagnosed with a rare condition that causes hundreds of painful tumors to grow on his bones all over his body. Irv is also one of four surviving patients in the U.S. that for 30 years has been supplied medical marijuana by the government for his medical condition. So they took me to an orthopedic surgeon and they noticed these bumps all over my body. That's when the local doctor said you've got multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis. Didn't know how to treat it except for surgeries and wanted me to go to a, a major research center. My great uncle being the head of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins, my regular uncle taught pediatrics at Yale. So we contacted them and the center was Boston Children's Hospital. So I was brought there two days later and there I was told what was going to happen to me. That there's a chance I might not outlive my teenage years, that these tumors could go malignant, but what they were really worried about is hemorrhaging, is tearing a vein over these tumors and a clot breaking off, going to your heart, your brain, your lungs, it could kill you. Luckily for Irv, despite having countless surgeries in his youth, he survived and was able to go on to college. It was during this time that he first gave in to peer pressure and tried cannabis. So I smoked and it did nothing to me, okay? This isn't doing anything, it's garbage, but I'm accepted, fine. About the 10th time I did it, I uh, played a game of chess, and I hate chess. I sat for 30 minutes before I lost. It was the first time in five years I'd sat for longer than 10 minutes. Prior to trying cannabis, Irvin couldn't sit or stand for more than 10 minutes at a time due to his condition. So immediately I thought, in what way did I take all the narcotics to allow me to sit? And I said, wait a minute, I haven't taken a pill in six hours. I wonder if there's any medical benefit to this garbage. Okay, so I called my orthopedic surgeon who'd known me since age 10. I told him what happened. He said, I have no idea. Contact your family. So I contacted them. I said, hey, let's find out if there's any medical benefit of this stuff. We looked and researched, and lo and behold, it had been a medicine in this country from 1860 to 1937. I went, voila, that must be what it's doing for me. I got to research this. So I'd use it for three weeks and get miraculously better. My intake of the heavy narcotics would decrease by 50, 60, 70%. And I was just much better spirited, and uh, I felt better. And then I'd stop using it, just to make sure it wasn't the warm climate of Miami making me feel better. And I'd go downhill. I did this three times until I was convinced that it was that damn illegal drug that was doing it for me. So I called the orthopedic surgeon and said, Doc, I'm going to drop out of college. I'm going to come back to Virginia. I'm going to write up my own scientific project, and I want you to be the researcher, and I'm going to be the patient. Around the same time he spoke to his doctor, Irv also found out that the U.S. government had and still has a farm at the University of Mississippi where they grow marijuana for medical and pharmaceutical purposes despite their Schedule I labeling. My doctor can give me morphine, but he can't give me marijuana? 
and this works best for me. So I went back to Virginia, I put my protocol together and got the doctor to sign it. And then for five years, FDA stand warned me. Despite being turned down by the United States Food and Drug Administration, Irv had learned of another patient, Bob Randall, who had become the first person to receive medical marijuana from the federal government for his personal use. Luckily for Irvin, he got a chance meeting with Bob Randall. I said, Bob, my name's Irvin Rosenfeld, and I've been trying to take on the federal government for over five years. And I showed him my research project. He looked at it. He said, you're serious, aren't you? I go, yeah. He said, the government had no intentions of ever giving it to anybody else. I said, they had no intentions of giving it to you either, but you got it. Meanwhile, Irvin got the University of Virginia's legal department and his congressman to represent him and his protocol to gain legal access to medical marijuana. I lobbied, got the law passed, got the governor to sign it in 1979. Got my doctor to write a prescription. I went to the pharmacist, handed it to them. I said, now fill it. And of course they couldn't. So now I'd complied with the Virginia law. I had a prescription. I went to a pharmacist. So now where you fill it is a gray area but I felt very comfortable now. Now I had legalization in Virginia as far as I was concerned. Well, meanwhile, University of Virginia taking my case gave them three years, gave FDA three years to contemplate what they wanted to do. And finally, the University of Virginia said, we're gonna sue you. It was then upon being threatened by the University of Virginia's law department that finally in October of 1982, the FDA granted Irvin a hearing. He would have 15 minutes to convince a panel of 19 doctors on why he should be given legal access to medical marijuana. So I said everything that I could, thought was important. And one of the things I said is my doctor and I had studied for the last 10 years that when I took, when I had cannabis, and I took Dilaudid, which is synthetic morphine, it enhanced the effects of the Dilaudid to where I didn't have to use as much. My intake was cut by 50, 60, 70%. But when I didn't have cannabis, my intake went sky high. You know, and so, because you couldn't get it sometimes, you couldn't find it. So now I finished speaking, and the chairman said, are there any questions from the, from the audience, any questions? Well, a guy in a white coat raised his hand, stood up, said, I really don't have a question, I have a statement. I'm a visiting oncologist from Venezuela. I'm here studying pain treatment for cancer. And what I've discovered is the best pain treatment you have is Dilaudid, which is what we have. And if this patient and a doctor have studied it for 10 years, off and on using cannabis, it needs to be studied with a, with a continuous supply. And sat down. Where well, you could see the faces on the panel, it's like, oh shit. So I said, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. He said, your presentation was very convincing and that you will become the second person in the country. Irvin's been able to use federally supplied medical marijuana for the past 30 years. So you might be wondering, what's his life like now? It might be hard to see here, but here's a bone tumor right here. They grow outwardly from the long bones into the muscles and the veins, stretching the muscles and the veins, making it very painful. So what cannabis does for me is it relaxes the muscles going over the tumors. So it's more of a muscle relaxant that relaxes the muscles, thereby easing the muscle tension and the pain. So really it serves for me as more of a muscle relaxant. There's a sack of fluid over every tumor called a bursar. That bursar is trying to protect the muscle and the vein from the tumor. Well, the more that's inflamed, the higher chance of malignancy. So cannabis serves as an anti-inflammatory. It keeps the bursa from being inflamed, okay? Now, these tumors I have should be growing, okay? I have a dis disorder, a second disorder, called a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, which means these tumors can develop new ones at any age, and existing ones can grow at any time. Now, I'll be 60 years old next month. I've not had a tumor grow since I was 21. Now, why is that? Doctors don't know. Maybe it's the cannabis. Cannabis, as it was originally known, was used for medicinal purposes long before it was ever used to get one high. In fact, this potent plant was used as a medicine for over 3,000 years. And it has only been illegal in the U.S. for the past 70 years. The history of marijuana, particularly its medical use, is as old as the history of medicine itself. Ancient records indicate that it was used in China as far back as 27 B.C. We're in the first known pharmacopoeia of the entire world called the Shennong Pensao. Uh, cannabis 
uh, receives a very important part in medical practice and allowing the first anesthetic for surgery to take place in ancient China using cannabis as the anesthetic for surgery. As the plant continued to slowly move out of Asia and India, it is believed to have been introduced on a larger scale into Europe by the 19th century. It was finally introduced to Western European medicine in 1839 by a man named W.B. O'Shaughnessy. He was an Irishman, a physician, uh, working in the British Army Medical Corps. And he did the first clinical trials on cannabis and produced a, a paper which has been revolutionary in, in Western medicine. By the late 19th century, every uh, pharmaceutical company in the world including Tilden's and Victor's companies in the United States, were marketing cannabis tinctures. This one was for children's teething. And if your child was, was cranky and colicky and having a hard time teething, you'd give them just a little drop of this cannabis oil and it would quiet them down immediately. It was very effectively used as a medicine, even for children, in the 19th century. From being the most widely used natural medicine and industrial fiber in history to becoming a forbidden drug, a few defining things happened that might have led to cannabis being banned. The first was the development of other medicines and other opium-derived drugs. The second aiding factor was that during the 1930s and the Great Depression, there was a lot of competition for jobs and racial tensions between Americans and other ethnic minorities who were also looking for work. Harry Anslinger and other political figures at this time started promoting cannabis as a drug used by these ethnic minorities. By the time the word marijuana came into existence in the United States in the 1930s, it was the Mexican uh, word for cannabis that was not considered hemp. Uh, many Americans were fin familiar with cannabis extract, usually called cannabis indica on the bottle. And instead of that, here's this new devil weed from Mexico, which nobody had ever heard of. At this same time, many newspaper owners and other media giants who were also invested in the lumber industry didn't want a plant that could be used as an industrial fiber to compete with their means of getting paper. Many articles were printed that not only played up the racial tensions, but also the psychedelic effects of the cannabis plant. And the result was in 1937, this new menace called marijuana was outlawed by Congress, which didn't know anything about it. And of course, there was a great deal of anti-Mexican prejudice during the Great Depression, simply because Mexicans came over looking for work. There was also a great deal of anti-black uh, racism in the Deep South. Uh, uh, cannabis was used by African-American stevedores in all the port cities. There are cannabis cultures growing all around America, and when it arrives in America, it's considered a terrible thing that these horrible immigrant foreigners do, and immediately, the result of the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937 was to eliminate marijuana from the pharmacopoeia. Today, marijuana is classified as a Schedule I drug. But back in the 1930s, before the ban, every major pharmaceutical company was selling it as a medicinal product. This is the way that Park Davis sold marijuana in the 1930s, uh, but it is botanical drugs pressed cannabis sativa made by Park Davis with a nice picture of their manufacturing plant. They also made a variety of tinctures and other substances that were sold commonly in every little apothecary and drugstore in America. So it is not a new drug. That's the emphatic part of this. This is a drug with medical history that goes back far beyond the founding of our nation. Continued cannabis and endocannabinoid research being conducted around the world. It's a wonder how the United States government still continues to support the idea of no accepted medical uses. 
If the reason for continuing this label is due to the lack of research, well then the government needs to allow for more studies that aren't just focused on how harmful the drug is. One such doctor in California who's researching whether or not cannabis is potentially helpful is Dr. Donald Abrams. So my first research in, in the use of cannabis uh, was done in 1997 when we looked to see if it was safe for patients with HIV who were taking the potent uh, anti-AIDS medicines to use cannabis in association with their protease inhibitors. And we found that cannabis was safe, that it didn't change the level of the virus, and in fact, if anything, it improved their immune system. It's also with the founding of the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research that Dr. Donald Abrams was able to study potential ways that cannabis may be helpful in the medical field. This Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research was able to fund clinical trials that looked at the potential medical benefit of using cannabis as medicine because the only legal source of cannabis in the country is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and they have a congressional mandate to only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. Contrary to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, some basic studies from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research are suggesting positive outcomes with regards to using cannabis. Another area where Dr. Abrams saw surprising results was with pain relief. We took patients with chronic pain uh, who were on a sustained release opiate, either morphine or oxycodone. And we subjected them to inhalation of vaporized cannabis three times a day to see what impact that had on the level of the opiates in their bloodstream and on their pain relief. Although the study is too small to make any major claims, there is a suggestion that adding cannabis to opiates uh, is synergistic. That is one plus one equals five instead of two with regards to pain relief. There's also increasing evidence suggesting that cannabis or cannabinoids may have direct anti-cancer activity it's themselves. And my friend and colleague Manuel Guzman in uh, Madrid is a PhD laboratory scientist who's done a lot of the work to demonstrate that this has potential in the test tube. But I think we need to move it from the test tube into humans and that's another thing that I'm interested in working on because I've seen in my own practice and my own life some impressive stories. My dear friend Michelle Aldrich, um, basically her integrative oncologist and I was very impressed with the effect that her use of a cannabis concentrated oil product had in addition to her conventional treatment in eradicating a fairly advanced lung cancer. Without any backing from the government, but desperate to save their own lives, there is a growing number of patients around the country that are reporting that cannabis is healing their cancers and other ailments. A patient of Dr. Abrams, Michelle Aldrich, is one of those patients. I found out I had lung cancer. It was diagnosed on January 12th of 2012. And it was overwhelming. Diagnosed with stage 3A lung cancer, the normal survival rate for this type of disease is said to be 25% over five years. Unfortunately, due to Michelle's bulkier lymph nodes, her doctor said her chances were less than that. And once you have bulky lymph nodes, it's reduced to 2 to 5%. After finding out the bad news, Michelle's friends reached out to her and suggested she try an alternate medicine. I got home that night and Jeannie Hara called me and she said, you have to take cannabis oil. And I said, where do you get it? And she says, Valerie Corral from Wham, down in Santa Cruz. So I called Valerie and I had it by Saturday. Cannabis oil is a concentrated substance derived from a full pound of cannabis. It contains multiple cannabinoids from the plant. And although some people use this oil topically, in Michelle's case, she took it orally in capsule form. This one in particular is called full extract cannabis oil. 
because of the oiliness and the stuff, I put it in a gel cap every night. So February 1st, I started the chemo. I was going to have four chemos. And uh, the night before, I started the hemp oil. And I did that um, all the time. My last chemo was April 5th. And the middle of April, uh, they did a CAT scan. And they wanted to see what what the, the chemo had done and whether we could do surgery or not. And the lymph nodes were dead, and they were, the doctors were amazed because they didn't expect that. They wanted to be reduced so they could operate on the tumor, but they weren't expecting them to be dead. So they wanted right away to do the surgery, and I said, wait, 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 wait. Let me finish the oil first. And at that point, they said, okay. With her doctor still deciding to go ahead and have the surgery, they were surprised at what they found once inside. Michelle's tumor was dead. When he took out the tumor, it was a uh, necrotic core. So it was all dead. And he only took out like this much of my lung, a uh, little resection, versus he was going to take out both lobes. That was at most amazing. It was a miracle. My experience with stage 3B lung cancer patients here at San Francisco General Hospital over the past 30 years is that we do chemotherapy and radiation up front in the hopes that they can go to surgery, but most of my patients don't make it to surgery because their tumor progresses even with the chemo and radiation. With Michelle, she did the chemo and radiation and the cannabis oil, and when she went to surgery, there was no cancer, and she remains, thank goodness, cancer-free today. And I want to wish everybody to go find it so they can stop it, too. I mean, if I can stop lung cancer in three and a half months, you know, people shouldn't have to go through years of chemo. Michelle Aldrich, who believes that she was miraculously healed by cannabis, there is another story of a woman who's defying the odds, and she believes it's her use of cannabis that has prolonged her life. This is Kathy Jordan, who has miraculously been living with ALS for more than 25 years. I was diagnosed and the first my I died was at 86. And by 89, um, I could barely walk across my house. And when from that Sunday, I could brush my hair. And by Friday night, I had to lay my head on the sink. ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a fast-acting neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and in the spinal cord. When the motor neurons die, the ability of the brain to initiate and control muscle movement is also lost. It's a horrible disease. It's, it's horrible. I don't, they don't know where it comes from. They don't know what causes it. She thinks of something. She wants to move her arm, but she can't because the signal's not getting from her brain to her hand. Depressed about her diagnosis, Kathy even considered committing suicide until her friend told her to try cannabis. So we kind of smacked it. I figured, what the hell? What's it going to do? Kill me? I thought I was going to end my life. And um, I smoked it. I literally felt, I always say it was like an electrical hum or a buzz in my body. Besides feeling better overall, Kathy also noticed that in the earlier stages of her ALS, when she used cannabis, she was able to walk better. All of a sudden, I can walk across my yard again. Originally, Kathy's husband, Bob, didn't like the idea of his wife using cannabis, but ultimately he too came around once he saw the positive changes in his wife's life. 
I really did get upset. I thought, oh, Christ, we're going to go to jail. You're smuggling dope and all this stuff. And I really didn't understand it. And I kind of thought, well, she's really not doing good with her own demise. Well, but I, I'm not going to say anything. Just that makes her happy. Let her be happy, you know? And then uh, I started seeing it change. And as time as time's going on now, she's aging naturally. Dude. What you've seen earlier is the devastation happened in the first three years. And then when she smoked the cannabis, it stopped. Now, almost 30 years later, Kathy is beating the odds. I get up every morning, I have two cups of coffee, I smoke two joints, and bring up any plant that I have um, produced that when I have a cough, it clears my lung. And the lung doctors are amazed when you light up a joint, you inhale, you get cut now, which is great for ALS, because your main problem is saliva. You have an excess of saliva. The appetite, the muscle spasms, uh, her whole attitude, everything improves when she smokes it. And there's got to be something to it. I just can't believe that now I'm 63. Um, at 41, I was supposed to be dead, dead, dead. And then, then um, I think it was 96, we got a letter from the federal government. I had to prove I was still alive. I, I actually said, you have outlived your exploration thing. You must prove that you are alive. <laughs> Now, besides outliving her expiration date, Kathy Jordan fought for her life using cannabis in a different way also. And she said, oh, no, I, don't, I don't feel good. Well, I took her to the doctors, and she had a, a cancerous tumor in her stomach. Desperate to save her life for the second time, knowing about the possible healing capabilities of cannabis, Kathy took cannabis oil for a few weeks before her surgery. When the doctor operated, she said she never saw a tumor do what that tumor did was it turned on itself and cut its own blood supply off. And the only thing I can give that credit to is that, that, that oil that she took. Yes, I have surgery, but I've never seen an ALS patient um, survive surgery. And I mean, you just, you have beat all the odds. And, Dr. Wood was just, like I said, he spent 35 minutes just pulling his hair like, oh my God, can I film you? Can I film you? I want to share again to my students. I said, yes. I said, I would even give you permission to say that the patient believes that cannabis is what keeps her alive. I just wish they would study it and find out what's going on because she's living proof that there is something. If anybody knows anything about ALS, it is one of the most horrible things you can watch. We've met doctors, we've met politicians, we've met other patients. We've tried everything that we know how to try to get these people to open their eyes and study this plant. It's an amazing, amazing plant. I have proven them all along. In fact, um, I really am outspoken only because I realize my doctors are dying and retiring. I'm outliving them. I'm telling you, this has stopped my disease. cases of marijuana healing medical conditions be explained from a scientific point of view? Well, perhaps, just maybe, we are wired for weeds, so to speak, and there is a system in our body that combines to cannabis on a molecular level. To answer that question, along with many others, we're heading to Israel, a country who has been a pioneer in the cannabis research field. 
This is Dr. Meshulam, the world's leading expert in this field and the grandfather of the medical marijuana movement. It was over 50 years ago that he first isolated THC and CBD, the active and inactive components in marijuana. And today, it is his original work that has led to many groundbreaking advancements in the medical cannabis field. When we started working exactly 50 years ago on cannabis, very little work was being done. People had looked into it, but uh, didn't really know how THC works. At the beginning, we worked on the isolation, the structural elucidation, uh, and synthesis of uh, both the active compound of many of the uh, other compounds. After years of working on this, Dr. Meshulam was able to successfully isolate the psychoactive component inside of cannabis called Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, along with many other chemical compounds of the plant, such as cannabidiol. There are also other compounds there, and we had to devise methods for uh, their preparation. So this took a few years. Dozens of researchers around the world knew that THC indeed affected the user and made them feel high. But researchers didn't know how this process actually happened. It wasn't until 1988 that a U.S. researcher named Alan Howlett first suggested that there might be a receptor, something actually inside the brain, that THC binds to on a molecular level and it causes a series of reactions to start. This idea of having a receptor inside the human body that is activated by THC was confirmed years later by a group at the National Institute of Health in the U.S. This first receptor was located inside the brain and they called it CB1. Then in 1993, CB2, the second cannabinoid receptor, was also characterized. Shortly after the discovery of CB1 and CB2, Dr. Meshulam identified anandamide, the body's very own produced form of THC. In the early 90s, 1992 and later, we identified two compounds that are endogenous, they're present in the brain, they're present in the body, they activate the cannabinoid receptor. Actually, there are two receptors. They are of extreme importance. The first compound we identified, we called it anandamide. Anandamide is a naturally produced molecular messenger molecule called an endocannabinoid. Anandamide has a three-dimensional structure that THC mimics. Think of them as organic cousins, if you will. Although one comes from the plant and the other is produced in our bodies, their effects on the brain are fundamentally the same. Then later we discovered another compound, and these two compounds are the main compounds that uh, 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 stimulate the two receptors. This they called 2-AG. The discovery of 2-AG was very important in that it established the existence of a cannabinoid system within the human body. So to put it all together, the cannabinoid receptors called CB1 found in the brain, plus the CB2 receptor in the immune system, along with the endocannabinoids called anandamide and 2-AG, and all the other molecules involved are a part of a relatively new body system that researchers are calling the endocannabinoid system. Today, it's the discovery of the new endocannabinoid system that researchers are continuing to study. The belief is that this new system, similar to a nervous system or pulmonary one, could be the key to keeping the body healthy. Our body has a general protective me a mechanism against uh, uh, foreign proteins, namely uh, viruses, microbes, and so on, the immune system. Now, how come we don't have a protective method, a mechanism, a system against other things? 
uh, and apparently the CB2 receptor, activation of the CB2 receptor is uh, a mechanism, a protective mechanism, including possibly cancer, including possibly uh, mental diseases, uh, schizophrenia and so on. This raises the question, why would a plant, the only plant in nature with cannabinoids, activate that same set of receptors in our body?